Thanks, Goya. Uh, morning, everyone. It's great to be together. Uh, this morning, uh, we are taking a step uh, outside of our sermon series in Ephesians, uh, and we're going to focus uh, on Pentecost, uh, recognizing that today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we're going to be thinking about the significance of this moment in the book of Acts and how it impacts our lives today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, let's have a look at um, Acts chapter 2. Uh, and here we see uh, a very clear account of what took place um, within the life of the early church. So Acts 2, starting in verse 1, uh, Luke tells us this. Uh, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, in Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk in new wine. Amen. So Father, we, we recognize that there is so much in this passage for us to, to think about uh, this morning, but I pray that in the midst of, of all that we might look at today, uh, that you would bring clarity to our hearts, that we would see both the simplicity and the power of the gospel and how this is manifest through this moment, how this then impacts our own lives and how we can then live as men and women in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you'd be with us. We pray that you would work in us. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that you would be speaking to me even as I share. And Lord, I pray that we would all have responsive hearts and a desire to rest in your power as we go into this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this morning we're basically going to do two things uh, as we think about this passage, uh, as we think about the subject of Pentecost. Uh, first of all, we're going to take time to understand what is actually going on in Acts 2, because there's a lot happening in this passage uh, and then from there, we want to take some time to examine how the events of Acts 2 have direct impact upon our own lives uh, today. Uh, and as we begin our time in this passage, I want us just to have this statement in mind, uh, which is essentially the beating heart of all that we're going to look at uh, over the next half hour or so, hopefully, God willing. Uh, basically, this is the essence uh, of what it is we're thinking about. Uh, Pentecost. It was a unique moment in history that has impacted every moment of history. Pentecost was a unique moment in history that has impacted every moment of history. Uh, what happened at Pentecost uh, changed the world. Pentecost changed the world. Not in a moment, but over many centuries, over a long period of time, there are many, many people of different continents, nations, tribes that declare, that have declared and do declare today that Jesus is Lord. And it's all because of the Holy Spirit uh, working within them. And it all begins at Pentecost. So for us to see the impact that it has on us today, we have to examine what was going on back then, what happened during this time. We need to consider exactly what happened in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. Because it all begins, this is the birthday of, of the church. This is the moment the church began. Uh, and this is not just a description of what God did back then. There is great encouragement for what it is God can do now within our own lives. So Luke begins with these words in Acts chapter 2. 
when the day of Pentecost had arrived. The day of Pentecost arrived. And it's important we understand this morning that Pentecost was a day. Pentecost was a significant day for the Jewish people. Pentecost was the second of the annual harvest festivals. It was 50 days after Passover, which is why Pentecost Sunday is 50 days plus an, plus an extra day after our Easter Sunday celebration. It's basically 49 days plus one. Because just as a Jewish Passover is the same day as our Easter Sunday, so the Jewish Pentecost is the same day as our Pentecost, which is essentially is the Christian Pentecost. And no doubt Pentecost as a festival, um, it was hugely important, significant for the Jewish people in their day. And through its significance, we see not only why the people celebrated this time, but we also see God's bigger plan, not only for the Jewish people, but for the whole world. Let me just share three reasons for why Pentecost as a Jewish festival uh, was in fact preparation for something much bigger, something that impacts us today. Uh, Pentecost as a festival spoke, first of all, as a new beginning, a new beginning. It's been really interesting just to really dig deep into this festival and just to see the connections between the Jewish people and all that happened in the Old Testament and all that God did in the New Testament, all that God is doing now. And in the Old Testament, the Passover spoke of God's rescue out of Egypt. The 50 days spoke of the 40 years in the wilderness. And the festival of Pentecost spoke of God's people entering into the promised land. That's what we celebrated. And in the New Testament and beyond for us today, Easter, Easter points to the crucified, risen, ascended Christ. The 50 days following spoke of God's people waiting for God through his spirit. And Pentecost, Pentecost speaks of a better promised land. We enter into a new promised land when we receive God's spirit. It's a new beginning. It's a new life in the spirit. So if we love Jesus today, this is what all of us have. We all have a new beginning. A life in Christ is a life in the Spirit. It's a new start for all of us. It began at Pentecost. The Spirit is alive and well within us today. So Pentecost as a festival spoke of a new beginning. This has impact for us today. Number two, Pentecost spoke of a first fruits. A first fruits. When you read Leviticus 23, 17, you see that, that Pentecost was a day when the Israelites offered the first fruits of a wheat harvest. Um, it's often known as Wheat Sunday or Whit Sunday, which Glasgow means something else. Um, they gave their very best. They gave their very best to God, their first fruits. But in our Pentecost, it's God who offers us his first fruits. God gives us his very best. He gives us himself to live within us through the person of the Holy Spirit. So you see how things are reversed. There's connection, but there's, there's difference. We give God our very best. If, if we were Jewish, we would have done that during the festival of Pentecost. But now we are in Christ with a new beginning. God gives us his very best through the person of the Holy Spirit. By offering the first fruits of the harvest, the Israelites during Pentecost said, God, this whole field belongs to you. And by offering us the first fruits of his Holy Spirit, God essentially says, this whole person belongs to me. So it's incredible just, just to see the connection between what God has done and what God is doing. So a new beginning, a first fruits, and finally a new covenant, a new covenant. In the original Pentecost, the celebration marked the arrival of the first covenant between God and his people. And in the New Testament Pentecost, the shift is not a celebration of the old covenant, but a realization that the new covenant was here through the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. So we are a new covenant people. And the sign, the symbol of it, the fact that we live in this new covenant is the fact that we have the Holy Spirit. Praise God, we have been blessed with the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit is evidence of that. So, verse 1 of our passage, the day of Pentecost arrives. And in that, that short phrase, 
when the day of Pentecost arrived, I hope we see there's so much that we can look at. We see a new covenant. We see a first fruits. We see a new beginning. We see what it is that God was doing. And we also see that they were all together in one place. So they all gathered together. All the disciples of Jesus were in one place, gathered together. And it leaves us asking a question this morning. What were they doing? As they gathered together, why were they all together? These guys all had busy lives. Many things had happened prior to this point of them gathering together. They all had many different things to do. What was going on within the lives of these disciples? What made them gather together in one room? And it must have been a big room. Um, they were all together. Most likely they were about 120 gathered in this upper room. So precisely what was going on in this moment? When you get to the root of what they were doing, it's really simple uh, and really powerful. These men and women were being obedient to the word of God. Uh, something that we all so often overlook from time to time. This is something that Claire touched on already. Uh, as we receive God's word, we are called to be obedient to God's word. And the spirit of God is always connected to the word of God. He moves in power when we hear the word of God and do it. And these disciples are gathered in this room because they are being obedient to God's word. And we know this because of what we read in Acts 1, 4 to 5. Jesus speaks. And when Jesus speaks, the word of God speaks. They gather together as a group and they wait as a group because Jesus told them to do this. They were, they were being obedient to God's word. Luke tells us that while he, as Jesus, was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. They were being obedient to the word of God. Not just in Acts, we also find this in Luke 24, 49. Jesus says, look, I am sending you what my Father promised, as for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Stay, wait, trust what I'm saying. You will be empowered from on high. It's from these promises and the disciples' obedience to what was promised that we read these words in verse 2 of our passage. They gathered together, they waited, and then we read this. We read, suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. Let's just put our hands up and recognize this is a strange moment. This is a strange moment. Uh, probably, most likely, none of us have been in a meeting where we experienced a mighty rushing wind. Uh, hopefully it was or a, a supernatural mighty rushing wind because God is clearly moving in this moment. It was perhaps not as strange for these disciples, however, because they knew their Old Testaments, they knew the reality of, of who God was and what God did. And most likely they knew Ezekiel's prophecy. In Ezekiel 37, verses 9 to 10, we read this. The prophet says, He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. The breath of God on a person leading to the life of God on a person and all because of the spirit of God at work within a person. Jesus also spoke and he used wind language to describe how as the spirit of God works. John 3 verse 8, Jesus says, the wind blows where it pleases and you hear it sound but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So there's backdrop to this. They, they see or, or they hear this wind and there's Old Testament backdrop to this, but there's also the words of Jesus here in John chapter 3. And if you know your Greek, you'll know the Greek word for Spirit is pneuma, which is also the Greek word for wind or for breath. So it makes sense that when the Spirit moves in this monumental event that is Pentecost, 
that one of the phenomena would be the sound of a rushing wind as we see that background. They didn't just hear the sound of something, they also saw something. And again, it was something hugely significant. We read this. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. And of all the sermons to preach on fire, of all the weeks to talk about fire, it's it's this week we're doing it. So no doubt, again, this is a bizarre moment. This is a strange moment. Little flames of fire sitting above every person's head. And that's, that's strange. It's definitely bizarre. The Greek actually describes this as divided tongues. So it wasn't just one flame. It was divided tongues of fire. What's the significance of this? <clears throat> What's going on in this particular moment? Two things I want to highlight. Firstly, God's presence in the Old Testament. His presence was often symbolized by fire. God's presence on Mount Sinai before he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 19, 14, we read, Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Where God's presence was, fire was. The covenant that God gave his people was a covenant that was symbolized by a presence of fire. It's the first thing. We also read of God's presence as a pillar of fire when he filled the tabernacle. And as he lived amongst the people, there was a pillar of fire. So God is making the point here that in a new and exciting way, he is going to live amongst these people. The tongues of fire symbolize something way better for us. Better than a mountaintop. Better than a temple. Secondly, the fact that the tongues of fire were divided points that we no longer need to meet in a place to meet with God. We don't have to go to a building. We don't have to go to a geographical location. We can meet with God where we are. And we no longer need to have a a special person like a priest or a prophet or a king to see the Spirit of God at work. We all have the same Spirit. Amen? All of us have the same Holy Spirit. We all have the same measure. We all have the opportunity to have the same measure of His Holy Spirit. It's available to anyone who is in Christ. I love what Sam Storms says as he talks about this moment. He describes it as the democratization of the Spirit. The the democratization of the Spirit. The Spirit is coming down and He is living with each believer individually. Forget ever thinking it's about who you are or where you are. It's about who He is. He is the Spirit. And where he is, he is dwelling within each one of us who are in Christ. All of which brings us on to verse 4 of our passage. Look, writes, They were then all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And there's three things that we see right up to this moment, this particular point in Acts chapter 2. There are three things I just want to highlight uh, from this passage, which help us just understand more and more of what God is doing here. Uh, First of all, the Spirit falls as a reminder in verse 4 that that we need Him. We need the Spirit of God. This moment in Acts 2 is significant, hugely significant, because we discover a common theme of how the early church functioned. Luke tells us so clearly that they spoke in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It wasn't themselves. It was nothing to do with them. It was as the Spirit enabled them. And the Spirit enabling these believers is what we see through all of Luke's account in Acts. There's never a point in the book of Acts where the Spirit is not doing something and God's people are being obedient to that. So much so that we could say it's not the Acts of the Apostles. Often we hear about the Acts of the Apostles. What we see in Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It is the Acts of God working through His Holy Spirit within the life of the early church. From chapter 1 through to chapter 28, you discover that it was the Spirit that led them. It was the Spirit that empowered them. It was the Spirit that filled them. It was the Spirit that even prevented them from doing certain things. It was all a work of the Spirit. And they never took credit for anything of what God was doing through them. They always recognized that it was God who was working in them. And they always gave God the glory 
because of that. All of which I hope is a sobering reminder that if we think, if any one of us thinks that we can live out this Christian life without a conscious awareness and dependence upon the Holy Spirit, then we are absolutely kidding ourselves this morning. If we think we can go solo, I'm just going to do this thing by myself, God. I don't need you. We are kidding ourselves. It is utterly impossible. Nothing is more important in your life than the extent to which you are reliant and empowered by God's Spirit day after day. Octavius Winslow, and what a name that is, by the way, Octavius Winslow. I feel I'd be more intellectual if I had that name. Octavius Winslow was a Baptist minister in England. He was a contemporary of Charles Spurgeon. And he said this on the role of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. He said, all that we spiritually know of ourselves, all that we know of God and of Jesus and his word, we owe to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And all the real lights sanctification, strength, and comfort we are made to possess on our way to glory, we must ascribe to him where he is honored and adoring thoughts of his person and tender, loving views of his work are cherished, then are experienced in an enlarged degree his quickening, enlightening, sanctifying, and comforting influence. And it's so true. It's all the work of the Spirit in our lives. We can't take credit for anything when it comes to the Christian life. And we have to be a people who are consistently dependent upon him. Samuel Chadwick, the great Methodist preacher of the 19th century, he said that a lot more succinctly when he wrote, the Christian religion is hopeless without the Holy Ghost. Hopeless. We are hopeless unless we are relying upon God's Spirit. So make no mistake this morning, that's true for us today. We need to recognize that today. We can't do this, this thing we call Denison Baptist Church, unless we are relying upon the Spirit day after day. So that's the first thing. The Spirit falls to show us that we need Him. Secondly, the Spirit falls, interestingly, to reverse the effects of Babel. So the story of Genesis 11, the people wanted to make a name for themselves, and so they built this tower, and God in his judgment caused them to be linguistically confused, geographically separated. Pentecost is the reverse of Babel. Babel started when people disobeyed. Pentecost began when people obeyed. Babel caused people to scatter. Pentecost caused people to gather. Babel was an act of judgment from God. Pentecost was an act of blessing from God. At Babel, Languages acted as a barrier between people so that God's purpose might be fulfilled. But at Pentecost, languages act as a bridge. Languages act as a bridge so that God's purpose can be fulfilled. So the Spirit falls to reverse the effects of Babel. And finally, number three, the Spirit falls in order that we can fulfill God's purpose. This is something we often overlook. When the Spirit works, when the Spirit is alive and well within us, and when we are relying and empowered by, by him, God's will is done. The Spirit enabled these disciples to speak in other tongues for one reason. This is what God willed. This is what he desired. And what we see from the rest of this passage is that God desired us because he wanted his people to be built up in Christ, and he wanted them to be a witness to the world all of which is a direct fulfillment of what we read in Acts 1, 7, the very words of Jesus, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses. So you will receive God's power to then be my witness, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. This is what we see in the rest of our passage, the Holy Spirit building bridges so that others might hear the gospel and respond in faith. In Acts 2, 7, we read, they were astounded and amazed so they could understand. And they were saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? This makes no sense. And yet we are understanding what it is that God is saying through them. And even when they're not sure what is going on, what it is we read in verses 12 to 13, because we see confusion at the end of this, this passage. Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2, beyond our passage this morning, 
Peter stands up. Peter preaches the word of God. Peter quotes the prophet Joel. He points him to this incredible truth that this gospel is for everyone. And Joel says in Acts 2, 17, and it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. All people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So the spirit is poured out on all people so that all peoples can know of who God is. So I hope we see there's a bigger purpose at play. In the midst of all this kind of strange phenomena, God is at work to fulfill his bigger plan. This is more than just the sound of rushing wind, tongues of fire, different languages being spoken. This is God's missionary heart for a broken world. This is God's plan. This is how the Great Commission is actualized, is fulfilled through Pentecost and all in the effects of Pentecost. Now, the question I want to ask this morning is, can God do this again? Can God do what we see in Acts chapter 2 again? Uh, could believers be gathered together like what we see here in this passage? And could they experience what we see in Acts? Like, for example, as we gather together one Sunday, could it be the case that we hear the sound of a rushing wind, individual tongues of fire are above us, we all start to speak in different languages. Could, do, could God do that again? Let me say that God can do anything. He can do anything. And we need to be open to the fact that God can do anything. We should never ever put God in a box, no matter how unusual or how surreal it might be. But in the rest of Acts, we don't see these three phenomena together again. And as far as I'm aware, in the rest of church history, I might be wrong, you might have experienced something different. We have not seen all three of these phenomena together again. These three phenomena signify the beginning of a new epoch, a new era. But they do not represent everyday markers for that the Spirit of God is with us. And it's really important we understand this. Because often we can think that we are not truly being Christian unless we have some kind of Pentecost Acts chapter 2 moment that the Spirit of God has come once. The Spirit of God doesn't need to come again. But make no mistake, the Spirit of God needs to work in us again and again and again. We need to be filled again and again and again. And we see this through Acts. We don't see what happens in Acts chapter 2 and the rest of Acts, but we see the Spirit working again and again. We see it throughout church history. We've seen it in this church. We've seen God move in power at various points because we've recognized at different points that we need him. We need his power. We can't do this by ourselves. We can't glorify ourselves. We want him to be glorified in him alone. So Pentecost opened the door to a new way of living for all people. And this is why we said Pentecost was a unique moment in history that has impacted every moment of history. I'm not convinced that we will see Acts chapter 2 again within the life of Denison Baptist Church. I'm fairly confident we won't, but I do believe we need the Holy Spirit. No question, we need His power every single day and every single moment. And there's often going to be moments of, of revival or many revivals within the life of this church where we call out to Him and we ask, God, would you visit us in greater power? Peter quotes the prophet Joel in Acts 2.17 and he reminds those gathered and it will be in the last days, says God, but I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And in this quote, we can often miss a really important phrase. That phrase, the last days. It's reference to the time between Jesus' ascension and Jesus' return when all things will come to an end and we will have a new heaven and a new earth. And if you're not aware, this is the time we live in today. We are living in the last days. We often confuse the last days with the last like 50 or 60 years before Jesus comes back. 
that the New Testament definition of the last days is a time between Christ's ascension and Christ's return. Just to give you one example, Hebrews 1 and verses 1 to 2, the writer of the Hebrews says this, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, so he's speaking about his present moment experience, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and has made the universe through him. So he's talking about the time of his writing. He is describing his days as the last days. So without question, our day today is also the last days. And I know it doesn't feel like that because it's been 2,000 years, but we are living in the last days. In that time, God has poured out his spirit on all people. That's, that's the whole point. In the last days, God pours out his spirit on all people, and we are a part of that. He has poured out his spirit on those who are living in Scotland and Glasgow in 2024, all of which is reason for why Pentecost was a unique moment in history that has impacted every moment of history, including this moment today. So how does it impact, it, impact us today? In what ways have we been impacted by Pentecost? What role does the Holy Spirit play in our lives? Today, the Holy Spirit is here amongst us. And as the psalmist says in Psalm 105, we want to be a people who seek the Lord and seek his presence continually. So there's two things we need to take hold of. God is with us, but we also want to seek his presence more day after day. This is a biblical reality, both in the Old and the New Testament. We seek God's abiding presence in our lives because we know that when the Spirit of God is filling us to the fullness, He does so for a number of reasons. And I just want to highlight four essential reasons for why we at Denison Baptist Church need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Here's four reasons. And I've mentioned these already. So this is very much a kind of covering uh, previous content. Number one, to be empowered. We need the Holy Spirit to be empowered. What I mean by that is simply to enable us to be the people who can effectively share the gospel with others, particularly non-believers. We need the Spirit to share the gospel. You know, David and Laura are going to lead us in a time where we're going to think about what it means to share our story. And there's still time to sign up for that. If you're still not sure 50-50, do join us for that. There's plenty of food for lunch. We would love for you to stay uh, after our service to go through that. The reality is we need the Spirit to share our story of what God has done. We, we are utterly hopeless without the Spirit to be an effective witness of what God has done in our life and the difference he can make in their life. In Acts 4.8, we read that Peter was filled with the, with the Holy Spirit and then he preached the gospel to the Jewish leadership. And that's Peter. Peter was filled with the Spirit and then he preached the gospel if that's Peter, that has to be us. We have to be a people who are filled. What we can often do from a place of not being full of the Spirit, but being full of something else, we can often try and share the gospel and we're kind of running on empty. And I've tried it. I know many of us have tried it. It's awkward. It's nervy. We sound kind of weird Christian-like. It's forced. It's unnatural. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's recognize we need his power to do this. God working in us. We don't stand a chance when it comes to evangelism unless God's spirit is alive and well. And don't fall for the lie that if you're full of the spirit once, then you're full of the spirit always. That's a lie. It's a demonic lie. Some Christians commit some of the worst sins imaginable. Are they full of the spirit when they do that? No. Paul commands us in Ephesians 4, 17 to be a people who are always full of the Spirit, to keep on being filled with the Spirit day after day. If we are always filled with the Holy Spirit, then why does he command us to be filled with the Spirit? Paul commands us to be filled with the Spirit, but if we are always filled with the Spirit, why does he command that? We need to be a people who are filled with the Spirit in order that we, we might be a people who then fulfill the mission of God. And the mission of God is to live in Christ and share the gospel with those who don't know Jesus. 
So if you see this, imp this is important, if you think, as you think about evangelism and being on mission, if you're a believer today and you recognize that that's important because that's what you see in scripture, don't start there. Don't start with evangelism or mission. Start with worship. Begin your time recognizing the ways in which you fall short, how much you need him, glorifying his name. Ask God to fill you. We're commanded to ask. Ask him to fill you more with his power and enjoy. May the joy of the Lord be your strength as you then reach out to those who don't know Christ. So that's the first reason. Second reason is to be gifted. To be gifted. So we need the Holy Spirit to be empowered. Number two, we need the Holy Spirit to be gifted. We need a wide variety of people with different gifts to serve in a wide variety of different ministries. Just to give one example, in Acts 6.3, we read of this account of how we decided who it was was going to serve tables in the early church. And Luke tells us that the 12 said this, and I love just this attitude. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. So they needed the Holy Spirit to then live out the gifting that God had given to them, and through that gifting to then be assigned to different areas of ministry within the life of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, we see a list of different gifts which God, through his spirit, appoints his church to serve in. So if any one of you here this morning, and I know there's many of us here this morning who serve in various areas of ministry, seemingly important or unimportant, seemingly obvious or more subtle, recognize that it is the spirit of God who has equipped you to do that. And it is the spirit of God who empowers you to do that in the midst of what you're called to do. So we need the spirit to be gifted. And the third reason why we need the Spirit is to be led. And we fall, we often fall into the trap that when we become Christians, we can just go and do what we want. We can just live our life in whatever way we feel is right without paying careful attention to what the Spirit is saying to our lives. Let me just share Acts 13 and verses 2 to 4. Here we see an example of how the Spirit leads into all that he had planned for the early church. We read this, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So you see the, the absolute necessity of the Spirit of God in leading the church into what he had planned for them. And I so want that for us as a church family. More and more, I see how God has done that in the past, but more and more, I want us to be a people who are led and open and obedient to the Spirit. So aware of the Spirit at work within us, that we go where he goes, that we say what he says, that we are obedient to his call. And finally, number four, the final reason why we need the Holy Spirit is to be helped. The Spirit is a great counselor. The Spirit is a great comforter. The Spirit is a great strength for us in the midst of whatever it is we're facing. John 14, 26, Jesus says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. And that word Counselor can be tr translated as Advocate or Comforter. And it literally means the one who draws alongside. So, this morning, if you're suffering today, if you're a Christian and you're finding life hard, then I just want to encourage you this morning, you have a great resource. You have the greatest resource. His name is the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He is God in us. He lives with us so that we can be helped in a wide variety of different experiences that we go through. don't know about you, but I need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to help me. When I'm at a loss as to what to do, I need God's Spirit. When I feel overwhelmed by a situation, I need God's Spirit. When I make a mistake, I need the Spirit to guide me. When I'm discouraged to a point that it feels like there's a mountain in front of me, I need the Spirit of God. When I experience grief or mourning, I need the Spirit. The Spirit is a comforter. 
The Holy Spirit is our divine source. Are you tapping into this divine source this morning? Are you relying upon his power? Apart from him, you can do nothing. The Christian life is utterly impossible. The Christian life is hopeless without him. As we think about the Holy Spirit this morning, and as we think about the fact that he is the one who empowers us, gifts us, leads us, help us, helps us, are you also aware that it's only through the Holy Spirit that God can truly be glorified within your life? God's presence serves the purpose of magnifying God's glory. And, you know, we can get so caught up with models and methods, programs and plans and techniques, we often forget to ask the question, is the Spirit of God working? Because if His presence is not with us, then what's the point? If it's not bringing God glory, then we're wasting our time. And like Moses in Exodus 33, we want to say to God this morning, I hope we all want to say to God this morning, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not make us go from here. And like Moses, I hope you would join me in saying this morning, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. God, we do not want to do anything as a church unless your presence and your glory are at the center. And this is what it means for us as a church to live under the canopy of Pentecost. All of this points uh, to our crucified and risen Savior. We cannot live life magnifying him, what he has done, unless we live in and through the promise of Pentecost. And so this morning, in the power of God's Spirit, if you have faith in Christ today, we are going to invite you, as we always do on Sundays, to come to this table and to recognize all that Christ has done for us and to recognize that because of what he has done for us on the cross, we now have the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is for anyone who has faith in Christ, for anyone who's not sure, anyone who's maybe still on a journey, still trying to work out what it means to follow him. We would invite you not to take the bread and the cup, but just to watch and observe and to trust that, that God is going to speak to you in this moment. And if you have any questions about this table, what it means, then do speak with us. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. But as often as we take this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. And right up until that moment when he returns, we have his Holy Spirit to live for him, to see him glorified in us so that we might see not only our lives transformed, but the lives of our family, our friends, our neighbors, our work colleagues transformed. It is all for his glory and it is for our good. Praise God for that. So we take this bread and drink this cup and we recognize this is a work of God. The Holy Spirit is enabling us to do this today. So do so with reverence and awe of who he is and what he has blessed us with. Let's pray together. Let's respond now in worship. <coughs> Father, we, we just invite you this morning to, to come in greater measure. Uh, Lord, we, we're not satisfied with what we see. We, we, we recognize that, that we, we do fall short in various ways. And Lord, I pray that you would protect us from a spirit of legalism that then thinks that we need to work hard in some way to, to earn this. Lord, I pray that instead of us thinking we need to work harder, that we would just be more open to what you want to do. So we pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to a greater measure of your spirit. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us as a church family. Take us, melt us, mold us, fill us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. We need you today. We thank you for that day that was Pentecost. And we thank you for the impact it has on us today. Help us, Lord, as we now take this time to respond in worship, to respond by taking this bread and drinking this cup. Lord, we pray that as we think about evangelism after our time today, that that would just be a really sacred time. That would be a precious time where you do meet with us and that we would have confidence going into this week to be able to give reason for the hope that we have. Bless us, Lord, and all that you have planned for us and the remainder of us.